All right, guys, today we're going to start talking about viruses and immunity. So we need to know what exactly is a virus. And a virus is an infectious agent that gr cannot grow or reproduce outside of a host cell. Because it cannot grow or reproduce without using our cellular machinery to do it, it is considered a non-living entity that's not really alive because it cannot do all the characteristics of life that other cells can do because a virus is not even a cell. It doesn't have a cell membrane. It does not have cytoplasm. It does not have all those organelles we learned. So we're gonna learn about the structure of a typical virus in here. And you'll see, if you think back to what a cell looks like, how different they really are. On the surface, if you look at the common cold right here, it does kind of remind you of a cell a little bit, but indeed is not. So the study of virus is called virology, which is a growing um, job market. If you're interested, be a virologist. You could work at the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, and study emerging viruses and help to create uh, strategies to reduce transmission, which you can imagine after the year we've had here with coronavirus, um, that the virologists have been very busy. So when it comes to viruses, they come in a variety of shapes, and I put a nice diagram in your note sheet for some of the shapes that they come in. Uh, just like everything in biological systems, shape dictates function. So the shapes of these viruses is what allows them to get into your cells. So some of them are helix shaped like a coil spring and that would be rabies and measles and the tobacco mosaic virus that attacks tobacco plants because plants also get viruses. Um, a cosahedron would be herpes or chickenpox or polio. And so again, these shapes are what help them trick the cells into letting them in. So viruses are very, very small. Like viruses can attack bacteria. Bacteria are tiny compared to our cells. And then a virus is tiny compared to a bacteria. So these things are super, super small. You basically need an electron microscope to see them well. Um, and that's how they can start tricking their way in through our proteins because they're so tiny and because of the shape they have. So uh, this bacteria right here is called a bacteriophage. I'm sorry, this virus. This virus here is called a bacteriophage. It infects bacteria. So this particular one, which maybe the shape is even familiar to you because sometimes they use this shape in different cartoons um, like Jimmy Neutron. And so when you look at these, what you see is this shape, and this shape is the head or capsid of the virus, which is a protein coat made out of protein. So it's not made out of phospholipids like the cell membrane and cells are, different stuff. And then inside you do have a nucleic acid, so they have either DNA or RNA. There's some viruses that only do their life cycle, or I should just say cycle, uh, using RNA, and they're called retroviruses. So these guys have that in there. There's no organelles. There's no cytoplasm. None of that stuff. All right, some of them have a protein tail that comes off, and they use these to attach to the outside of the cell, and then they kind of squat on it like a squatty potty, and they squirt in their DNA. The DNA is the only part of the virus that actually or RNA that actually enters the cell. The rest of it just falls off the outside. So here's another uh, virus, a different shape. So this virus is a very typical shape of virus. And this is a retrovirus, has RNA in it, has a capsid, just the same, that protein coat. And all these little structures on the outside are these different little protein structures and glycoprotein structures that play a role for this guy in tricking the cell into letting them in and to attach to the cell. Um, so if you look at coronavirus, this is the coronavirus and you can see all the different glycoproteins and proteins on the surface of this guy. And so I mentioned this in class for those of you who were in class. Um, I don't know if I mentioned it in the lecture, but when you look at coronavirus, how this virus got into humans is it was found in other organisms like bats and it had a mutation, which viruses do. They mutate all the time. And the mutation was in some of these proteins that are on the surface of the virus that changed the shape. And it changed the shape of those proteins just enough 
to allow them to now get into human cells. And so that's just random that that happened. And it happens quite often, actually. So here are some common viruses. So here's like the fancy names, and then here's like the common names on the side. <coughs> so we have adenoviruses, like the common cold. Um, flaviviruses, these are hepatitis, different kinds of hepatitis. You have mononucleosis, which we just call mono. Uh, cold sores are a virus. Uh, chicken pox, which can also be shingles when you're older, that's a virus. Many of you were vaccinated against chicken pox, whereas my generation was not. Um, even warts, warts are caused by a virus, not from frogs or toads, which is old wives' tale. Uh, measles and mumps that you were all vaccinated for in order to come to school. Uh, smallpox, which we eradicated from nature using vaccines. Um, HIV AIDS. Uh, there's even some leukemias and other cancers that are associated with viruses. And rabies. So these are all different kinds of viruses and you have to put a couple of those in your notes. So when a virus meets their host, basically, like I said, it just attaches to the cell and it squirts its genetic material into the host. And then those, that DNA incorporates itself into the host DNA and that gets copied into RNA. The RNA goes to the protein or goes to the ribosomes and it creates proteins. And those proteins assemble to make more viruses. So they're basically using the host cells organelles to create more of its own army. It's just taking it over. And then that infected cell, as it makes all these viruses, eventually bursts and lets all the viruses out. So this is what it looks like. Here's my bacteriophage here. And he's gonna come in and attach, this is a bacteria, you can see the circular DNA, that's the plasmid. And he's gonna attach this cell wall and he's gonna do his little squatty potty looking thing, right, squats in. And then you're gonna watch the DNA or RNA come in there's your viral DNA or RNA, and that is then going to be incorporated into the regular uh, DNA and be copied, and they're starting to assemble all these little parts that will eventually turn into more viruses. And then these viruses are released from the cell, and in that process, they actually break your cell. All right, your cell is dead now. And these viruses will float out to infect all the surrounding cells. So when it comes to viruses, we have two phases. We have lysogenic, which has genic in it for genes, and lytic. So lysogenic is when the viruses are dormant. So this is when you've caught the virus already, but you don't know that you have it because it's not making other viruses yet. Its DNA is in your cell, but it's just chilling out in there, dormant. There's no change in the host, and at this point, you are typically not... Um, not shedding the virus as well where you can infect others. So lysogenic is a dormant phase, and that's why you can be around one of your friends that has the flu, and you go home and you're like, oh, I'm fine, but then about a week later, you get the flu, and you're like, where did I get the flu from? I haven't been near anybody with the flu for a week. Well, you caught the flu that one day, and then you were dormant, and you didn't know you had it. And so that's what coronavirus can do as well, is you can be exposed to somebody who has coronavirus and has no idea that they have it because they're showing no symptoms and they're in the lysogenic phase and then they start to switch into another phase and they shed them and they're still not experiencing um, any symptoms yet because they don't have a high viral load and you catch that and you don't know that you have it and you go home and then it would spread from there. So lytic is when it becomes active, and most viruses become lytic when your body becomes stressed. So a lot of people get sick around stressful events, like something's going on, you're not feeling well, like you're stressed about a test, and you haven't been sleeping, or you haven't been taking care of yourself, and then you get sick associated with that. Um, so this stimulates the virus, and then the virus goes from lysogenic to lytic, and some viruses go lytic very rapidly, like you get sick very rapidly, and other ones don't. And so at the lytic cycle is when they're actually creating the new viruses that's going to kill your cell and infect the other cells. So if we think about this in relation to HIV AIDS, so HIV AIDS has two names for this virus. HIV is the AIDS virus when it is in the lysogenic phase. When people have HIV, uh, the DNA of the virus is in there, in their cells, and every time their cell divides, 
it copies that DNA with its own, so every cell has a copy of that DNA. But when you have HIV, you show no symptoms. You can still exchange that viral DNA with other people, but you yourself show no symptoms, and that's why you need to be careful out there and protect yourself because you could land up getting this virus without realizing that other people have it because they might not know either. Now, eventually, at some point, especially if you don't have the good drugs, because if you have good drugs, the good drugs for HIV, they keep, they keep your um, cell in the lysogenic phase so that it doesn't turn into AIDS. Because when it turns into AIDS, this is when you actually experience the symptoms associated with that virus. All right, so here we see this diagram of the virus life cycle. So the virus in the lytic comes in, it puts its DNA in, and then while it's in lysogenic phase, that DNA is dormant, but every time the cell divides, it gets a copy. So Magic Johnson, who's a basketball player, he has had HIV for like, I don't know, like 20 years now, maybe longer. And uh, he has all the best drugs, he has lots of money. So his drugs have been able to keep him in the lysogenic phase. So he's living a really long lifespan with HIV. And as long as it stays in HIV, he's good, but he could still give a, uh, HIV to others. So he has to be careful. But the problem is when he switches from lysogenic to lytic, because he's had this for so long and his cells have to been dividing all that time that almost, almost all of his cells have the viral DNA in it right now. So if he switches to lytic at some point, all those cells are gonna produce viruses and burst, and he's gonna die really, really quickly at that point. So we have different ways to control a virus. One is, of course, vaccination. So a traditional vaccine is made out of a solution with a basically harmless version of the virus. They heat the viruses up, so they become denatured, which changes their shape. And because their shapes are changed, they cannot get into your cells. But your immune system still reacts to the proteins on the surface of that foreign invader and create memory cells against that virus. So that if that virus gets in your body again, it kills it off right away. So you don't even know you ever have the virus. Now, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine that has come out for the um, coronavirus, this is not new technology. They were working on the technology to make these vaccines long before coronavirus became a thing. And so part of the public's hesitancy about these vaccines is how quickly they were made. And they don't realize that they were working on the technology already for literally years before this even happened. But these are RNA vaccines. And how the um, RNA vaccine works is they take the code, an RNA code for just the protein on the surface of the virus. And they put that in your body in the solution, which is just a lipid solution. And that mRNA goes into your cells and your, pro and your ribosomes make the protein that's found on the surface of the virus. So there's literally no virus in those vaccines. So traditional vaccines are pretty safe. These vaccines are even safer than them. So your own ribosomes make the protein and then you have an immune response, just like a regular vaccine, to that. So then you get other people out in the public who say, well, when I get vaccines, they made me sick or I got the flu shot and it gave me the flu. Well, no, that's not what happened. What happened is one of two things. Either A, when you went in to go get your flu vaccine, you already had a virus and you were in the lysogenic phase and did not know it. And that's part of why uh, your nurses and people who give your vaccines, they ask you if you've been sick. That's part of what's on the paperwork there because if you're already immune compromised, they don't want to give you the shot at that point because your immune system is already busy and you're not gonna have as good of a response. So if a virus is already in your body and it doesn't even necessarily have to be the same virus and you get a vaccine, your immune system is gonna try to, it's gonna be responding to that vaccine and that will stress your body and then the virus that's already in you dormant will become active and go into the lytic phase. So that's one possibility. 
More likely, the other possibility is that when you get vaccines, your body has an immune response. And as we saw in the flu video, that when you have an immune response, your body actually does things to make you feel terrible so that your immune system can deal with that foreign invader. And even though the foreign invader is, is a fake foreign invader, your body responds the same way. So it makes you achy and tired and you may get a fever and that's your own body doing that. And so you're tricked into thinking that you're sick from the virus when really it's just your own immune system doing their job. And so with the huge numbers of people going out and getting the coronavirus vaccine, a lot of people are whining about the fact that it makes you feel bad. Well, it makes you feel bad because your own body is doing that as it tries to fight this foreign invader. And because this is a novel virus, when your body is not used to fighting, it's a little bit harder for your body to deal with that and you have a more extreme immune response. And so actually, if you feel a little bad after your vaccine, that means your vaccine is doing its job. You're gonna have an immune response and create those memory cells so the next time that virus gets into your body, your body kills it off right away before it can do any damage. And that's why the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines have a 100% rate for keeping people out of the hospital. You can still catch coronavirus again. It's still going to get in your body, but your body is going to kill it off right away, which without the vaccine, it would not do because this is a brand new virus. So everybody should be going out and getting their vaccines as soon as they are available. All right, and then the other thing we have to control some viruses are antiviral drugs. These are drugs that inter interfere with the virus's ability to make more nucleic acids, which means they can't make more viruses. We don't have as many antiviral drugs as we do antibiotics, and some of them can actually damage your organs. So doctors are reluctant to give you those unless they really have to. So we can get uh, immunity to viruses in a couple ways. One is active immunity. That's where you get sick. So like with coronavirus, again, if you catch the coronavirus, you are immune to the virus for a certain amount of time. It's not forever, okay? It's a certain amount of time that your memory cells stick around. So approximately right now, we think maybe six months to a year. Um, the vaccines actually provide, they've shown the vaccines provide more of an immune response than actually being sick with coronavirus. Uh, so the number of antibodies present in your body after the vaccine is significantly higher. And that's why even when people have had coronavirus, that they're still recommending they go and get vaccinated so that they have, have a higher rate of memory cells of those, a higher immune response so that if you catch it another time, your body kills off right away and you don't have twice the damage done to your body. The other way that you can get immunity is passively, and that means without getting sick. And the best way to do that is through your mother's milk. If mom breastfed you, you get some of mom's antibodies that she has and they get passed on to you. And that is the benefit of breastfeeding for women is to pass on some of your immunity. So why do we have to go and get the flu shot every year? Why do we not have vaccines yet for things like HIV? Why might the coronavirus vaccine only be good for six months to a year? Well, the reason why is because viruses mutate. And the coronavirus has already mutated three times. That's the variants that you hear about on the news, where there are these slight mutations that change them just enough that either make them more more contagious or our, our vaccines have a harder time fighting them, even though right now, most of our vaccines are still pretty successful against the variants. So uh, for the flu, flu, you have to go and get the flu shot every year. And the reason why you get it every year is the flu mutates pretty rapidly, um, a couple times a year. And when you get the flu shot, there's actually not just one version of the virus in there, there's a couple. And so what they look at is the other half of our earth their flu season is in a different time of year than our flu season. So they watch over there and see which are the predominant flus that are floating around. And that's what they put into their vaccine. Sometimes they guess wrong as to which one's gonna be the dominant one. And our flu vaccines are not as effective then, though they still protect against the other varieties of the flu. 
So they don't put them all in there. They can't. So they can only put so many in there and, and have it be effective and cost effective as well. So that's why we have to get that every year. Those things they just mutate. And that's why we don't have vaccines for HIV and the common cold, because those viruses mutate even more rapidly. And thanks goodness, we don't see that in the coronavirus right now, that it's not mutating that quickly, um, that with vaccines will probably work against that virus. Um, they're working on HIV on some other ways that we might be able to make vaccines for HIV and with technology and advancement of technology and the speed in which we could now produce some of these vaccines, there is the possibility for an HIV um, vaccine down the chute, okay? So back to HIV, because this is a really important one to keep yourself safe with. The reason why HIV is so particularly nasty is because it actually attacks your own immune system. So nobody dies of HIV AIDS, but HIV AIDS destroys your immune system. And then you die of a secondary infection that normally your immune system would just take care of for you. Without your immune system, none of our drugs can keep you alive without an immune system. So uh, you have to be really careful with that. And how you get HIV is through exchange of bodily food. So you cannot get HIV from kissing because there is uh, cells in, in your saliva that would destroy any viruses. So they protect against that. So you can kiss somebody with HIV. That's fine. You can hug them. You can share food. Bugs cannot give you HIV. You can't get them from a mosquito even. You cannot get it from toilet seats or bathing together, or sneezes or coughs or sweat. You have to have the exchange of blood and not dry blood, fresh blood. So you can get it from... Uh, people who have HIV who are actively bleeding, which is why if you're going to help somebody who is actively bleeding, that you should put gloves on as a protective measure. Uh, you can get it through intercourse if you do not use protection to do a barrier between you and the exchange of blood. All right. And then, of course, if you're sharing needles or something like that as a drug addict, you could get it that way as well. So when we're looking at immunity, we have... Um, vaccines for a lot of things, but viruses can cause things like herpes, which we call cold sores, but it's really the herpes virus, uh, tuberculosis, polio, and measles. So all of these have profound effects on humans and were very common in the past, and especially measles and polio and TB, those things have kind of gone away with vaccines. And so this all comes back to what is a pathogen? So pathogens cause disease. Any foreign invader that enters your body and is allowed to multiply is considered a pathogen and results in disease. So we're focusing on viruses right now, and we're going to be talking about bacteria. They are also a pathogen. You have parasites that are pathogens, fungi that can be pathogens, invertebrates like bugs that can be pathogens, or even protists that we've talked about before like with malaria. So all these things have antigens on them, just like your red blood cells have antigens when we talked about blood types. And that's what provokes the immune response, those protein antigens on the surface. And so disease is basically a malfunction of your body when things are interrupting the normal function. And it's infectious if it can spread from person to person. So the parts of your immune system that play a role in this, there's phagocytes that we saw in the video we watched. These guys do phagocytosis. They surround and engulf the invaders. And we have some different kinds. We have neutrophils that come in first and try to neutralize the infection. And macrophages, Mac micro means little, macro means big. So that's the guy down there in the corner. Macrophages come in and they eat cell debris and they'll eat any of the pathogens they come in contact with. So the neutrophils show up first. And if they can't kill off the infection, then they bring out the big guns after that. All right, and then after that, if it still persists, you go into your lymph nodes and you look for your lymphocytes. So we have T cells and B cells, which are both immune cells found in your lymph node that are produced in your bone marrow. Uh, T cells recognize and attack specific antigens, and they're called helper T cells that they go over and basically flag uh, infected cell and say, hey, this cell right here is no good. All right, and then the killer T cells will come over and actually destroy the cell that the virus is in. B cells are different. They don't leave your lymph node, but they produce antibodies that do. So the antibodies uh, flood out into the system and they attach to the viruses 
and basically smother it so it cannot get into your cells and then eventually the macrophages will eat those guys. So here is the green is the antibodies and the purple is the virus and you can see how they smother it and then it just bounces off the cell because it messes up its shape and it can no longer trick the cell into taking it in. Then here's a real picture of some macrophages and lymphocytes. They're dyed purple because in real life they're white. <laughs> so the purple just makes it so you can see them. And so the end result of this is to have memory cells. So the memory cells are T and B cells that remain in the body after an infection has been destroyed. And they provide you with that active immunity that if the virus ever gets in there again, they kill it off right away. They remember it, hence the name. So when we are sick, our body's reaction to being sick, the first defense against any virus or other pathogen is sweat on your skin is actually toxic to bacteria and helps to kill it. The mucus in your nose and your nose hairs help to trap invaders to keep them out from in. Now this doesn't stop everything, hence the masks that we're wearing for coronavirus uh, is to keep those from going into our airways. The other things our body do is they create a fever. They elevate your temperature naturally, which makes you feel bad, uh, but is a normal reaction that your body does to fighting an invader. And what that does is slows the virus's ability to reproduce. All right, and then if we get an infection, other things that can happen is in, in your skin especially is you can have the inflammatory response. So in the inflammatory response, like if you get stabbed with a rusty knife, the cells around there release a chemical alarm signal that says, hey, there's damage been done here, send reinforcements. Your capillaries, which are your tiny blood vessels, will swell and bring a lot more blood, including your white blood cells, to that area. And that causes your area to swell and get warm to the touch. Then your phagocytes, right, are going to come in and they're going to start eating the infection. And what they make as a byproduct while they're eating the infection is they create pus. And pus is a dead pathogen. So if you think about a pimple, a pimple is essentially a tiny little inflammatory response where some bacteria got into your hair pore and the cells around there said, hey, we got an infection over here and the capillaries expanded, which is why where your pimple is gets raised up and swells. And it's too small usually for you to tell that it's warm to the touch but it is warmer than the surrounding area. And then your body starts fighting that infection. And so like a day or two later, you get a white head. And the white head, when you get to that point, that's when your body's already fighting that infection and your pimple is close to being done. And so whether you remove that white head or not, uh, the pimple's gonna be gone a couple days after that, unless uh, you get another infection on top of that. So right here you can pause because I am going to, you're finished with your virus notes, but I'm going to continue this lecture and go ahead and do your bacteria notes in one big shebang, which we will not be doing till week 32. So next week you can pop right back into this video and find bacteria because it's only a couple slides and get your notes for bacteria. So with bacteria, we have two main kingdoms of bacteria, and they both have bacteria right in their name. So we got you bacteria, you means like true. So true bacteria is your common everyday bacteria, the bacteria that's on your skin, in your gut, up your nose, that's everywhere. And then we got archaea bacteria. Archaea bacteria are like a primitive type of bacteria that lives in extreme environments, all right? Places where you wouldn't think bacteria could leave like the thermal vents and the bottom of the ocean down here. And they can live on salt, and they're called halophiles, and they can live in acid, and they're called acetophiles. So they live in places you normally wouldn't think that life could persist. When we're talking about bacteria, we have three basic shapes, rod, spear, spiral. So the rod shaped is otherwise known as bacillus, or bacilli for plural. And then we have the spherical one, which is called cocci, or for, for plural. Um, and these guys, I think of a ball of caca, that just helps me remember. And then spirilia is the spiral, so that one's easy. So if you remember this one, because it's easy, in the ball of caca part, you can get bacillus by uh, process of elimination. So we classify a lot of our bacteria in, based on this, and a lot of times they, these are in the names of them. 
So we have prefixes as well. So strep stands for chain. So if you have strep throat, they look for a chain of bacteria in the back of your throat when they put that swab back there. It's called streptococcus because it's a chain of cocci bacteria, circular ones, and you can see that there. That's what they're looking for when they swab your throat and put it on their microscope. Uh, Staphylo, like a staph infection, are clusters instead. So you can have um, staphylococcus or staphylobacillus, and these are little clusters of the bacteria. So characteristics of our bacteria, some of them are heterotrophs, which means they eat different organisms. They're eating other organic matter like decomposers. And some of them are autotrophs where they make their own food automatically, and that's going to be through photosynthesis. And you can guess that if you're autotrophic, you're going to be green, okay? Um, for oxygen requirements, some of them are aerobic, which means they rely on oxygen, and some are anaerobic, which means they don't. So the bacteria that lives inside your intestines are anaerobic. They don't need oxygen. But the bacteria that lives on your skin does. They're aerobic. As far as pH and temperature, they all adapt to different situations. So there's a huge variety for that um, of what bacteria can do. So how do bacteria cause disease? Well, they produce toxins. So when the bacteria gets on your tissue, and this particular one is a staph infection, called MRSA, and MRSA, there's antibiotic resistant MRSA. Um, that's why you wanna cl clean your gym equipment, especially your mats. If you get MRSA in your skin, it releases toxins um, that are digestive enzymes that basically liquefy your skin tissue, and the bacteria are feeding on that, they're eating you. And this, of course, then interferes with the normal function of your skin, and your skin is to keep bacteria out. So once they get through that skin and they reproduce in there, the bacteria get in deeper and cause more and more problems. And so that's a real issue for athletes. So with our bacteria, antibiotics work only on bacteria. They do not work on viruses. There are natural antibiotics that are derived from chemicals that bacteria and fungi produce. And that's one of the ways that we, we found these things and, and learned how to use them. And they're made for, um, to keep bacteria and fungi from foreign invaders, right? To keep them from being invaded. So antibiotics are designed now in a lab uh, to interfere with the cellular functions of bacteria so they cannot reproduce, and that inhibits their growth. So for example, penicillin, which is that pink bubblegum stuff that you got as a little kid, um, interferes with the bacteria's ability to make a cell wall. And so if they can't make a cell wall, then remember that cell wall is rigid and protects if they can't make that, it makes it a lot easier for your body to kill off the bacteria. Uh, tetracycline, which is also another common antibiotic, interferes with the um, bacteria's ability to do protein synthesis, to make proteins. And if they can't make proteins, they can't reproduce. And so then your immune system has a chance again to kill off that population before it breeds and gets too large. So back to our MRSA issue with antibiotic resistance. We talked about antibiotic resistance when we were talking about evolution a little bit. Um, so remember that with this, when we overuse our antibiotics and use them when they should not be used or use them in feedlots um, for our livestock, uh, these bacteria mutate. They mutate readily. And then you land up with some that the, does, the antibiotic does not work on, and they're going to be the predominant one to survive and reproduce. And then eventually your population is mostly resistant bacteria, which are harder to kill. And that's how you get this antibiotic resistant uh, MRSA. And it all starts with a mutation. That's all it takes. So not all bacteria are bad. Oh, there are lots of useful bacteria. Uh, they are decomposers. So they break down organic matter as part of our carbon cycle and put those and nitrogen cycle and put those nutrients back down in the soil, which life as we know it would not exist without that. Uh, we use them in the production of food, the digestion of food within our digestive tract. We use them in industry for a variety of things. And we've even genetically modified the cleanup oil for, from environmental disasters.